Okay, if you remember, we were just stopped at this point and we were discussing edge flip operation. Why do we need it? And what happens if you do a kind of an edge flip operation to the triangulation? Now you see we have two triangulations. We can obtain the other one, this one, the one on the right hand side, by simply doing an edge flip here. This edge is actually uh, not correct one since uh, we have the angle requirement, if you remember, we want to maximize the minimum angle. Right now, the minimum angle is, I guess, f of four, but we can have a larger minimum angle by simply doing an edge filling operation. So edge filling is actually performed between two triangles, two neighbor triangles. And as you see, instead of having this edge here, right now, once you do the edge filling operation, we will have an edge between points L and K. And now, as you see, uh, our minimum angle is more than the minimum angle of the previous case. So if that's the case, actually, if you have some many triangulations and if uh, the minimum angle of a triangulation is uh, smaller than the minimum angle of other triangulation, then you can say that the previous one in our case, the left one is an illegal one. This has an illegal edge and it has to be legalized by simply doing an edge flip operation. Now we have some theorems, some observations. Let's have a look at them one by one. This is the first one. We have the initial triangulation tau and it has an illegal edge E as in the case of previous slide. And then now we have another triangulation tau prime, and it's simply obtained by uh, obtained from tau by doing a flipping operation on the edge on the illegal edge E. Then we can say that uh, the angle vector of tau prime, the Neve triangulation, is lexicographically larger than the angle vector of the initial triangulation. Now we have another a small theorem, lemma four. Again, as you see, we have four sides, four points. And with the help of them, we can in maximum have two triangles. This is a triangulation of an polygon. Actually, it's a triangulation of an quadrilateral. We have four corners. So let's go through the lemma. We have an edge PIJ. This is the intermediate edge. It's obviously incident to triangles, upper triangle and lower triangle. And then we have a circle C. And this circle C is going through I, A, K, and J. As you see, it's not passing through the all sides, all corners. It's just passing through three of it, three of them. And now we can say that the edge PI and PJ is illegal if and only if the point PL, which is not on the circle, is uh, inside its resize interior of the circle C. If that's the case, without looking at the angles, without computing the minimum angle, we can simply say that uh, this is in this is an illegal edge and it has to be legalized. And furthermore, if you have uh, all these points once again, and if they are not on the common circle, then we will have exactly one of these one of these uh, edges as illegal edge. But if they are on the same circle, uh, we can say that there is no illegal edge. We can continue with the other part of your triangulation. But if you have just three of these points on the same circle, one inside, then you can simply say that uh, the interior, the edge, which is actually incident to the to two triangles is an illegal one. So we simply define actually legal triangulation as to be the one uh, which has actually no illegal edge. So we are trying to find the legal triangulation which has no illegal edges. And we can also say that if you optimize the angles, then that triangulation is a legal one. So how we are going to compete the legal triangulation? It's not that complicated. Once you have any kind of triangulation, you can simply uh, do flipping operations and obtain the legal one. 
So this is the only operation we need to have uh, while uh, converting an illegal triangulation to a legal one. So that's our actually simple algorithm for that. Uh, the procedure is called as legal or legalized triangulation. So the input is an initial triangulation, a random triangulation tau. And obviously we have a point set for that. And the output will be the legal triangulation of the same point set P. And then the rest is very straightforward. What we do, we check the triangulation uh, if it has illegal edges. Once you come up with an illegal edge, then what do you do? You simply flip that edge and legalize that portion. And you continue doing these operations until you're, uh, you're done with all the illegal edges and all the edges inside your triangulation are legal. So that is a very uh, basic triangulation or basic legalization operation on an initial triangulation. Any questions, guys, about these uh, basics? Okay. Now let's start going into domain triangulation. Do you see uh, a similar thing we discussed last week or on Tuesday? What do we have here? Do you hear me, guys? Teacher, isn't it a Voronoi diagram? Yes, right. As you see, we have dashed lines as the Voronoi diagram, right? These are the edges of the Voronoi diagram. We have the vertices of the Voronoi diagram. And these are the sides of the Voronoi diagram, right? And what we have done here is that we are connecting these sides actually who are uh, neighbors. If you look at, for instance, these points, these sides, Voronoi sides, they are sharing a common edge. This is the common edge between, let's say, I and J. So what we do while obtaining this graph, this is, by the way, a graph. connected graph, yeah, right? And how do you obtain this graph? It's obtained by simply connecting the Voronoi sides who are actually sharing a common edge. And we are passing this actually curve uh, on the uh, common edge. Not we, are, we don't have a straight line. What we do, we go over the edge and then travel to the next Voronoi side. And it's also the same for other ones. For instance, we have a uh, common edge here, and now we are connecting this one with the other one here. You see we have a kind of a curve. But for this one, it's quite easy since uh, you don't need to go over, since the common edge is already in between these sides, so we can simply have a straight edge, a line. But for other ones, we need to have a uh, kind of a curve. If you look at here, for instance, this is a common edge between this one and the other one here. So our curve should pass through this little portion. That's why we have kind of a curve in between these two Voronoi sides. So once you have this one, and in the next slide, you'll see that it's easier to obtain the Delnoy triangulation. So once you have uh, the Voronoi diagram of the given size, then the Delnoy triangulation, the computing of the Delnoy triangulation is very easy. You can simply connect these sides and obtain the Delnoy triangulation. You see, we actually make them as lines. We converted some of these curves into lines and obtain the Delnoy triangulation. So that is simply the Delnoy triangulation of the given size and they are all angle optimum. Their angle vector is uh, larger than the other triangulations. So once you have the Voronoi diagram, then you don't need to worry about other details. You can simply join the sides together and obtain the Delnoy triangulation. Let's go back to the previous slide here and have discuss some properties of this graph. 
this is by the way graph right now this is not a triangulation since we don't have any triangles actually we have one here but it's uh dress is not the rest of the regions or the cell spaces are not uh, triangles we only have a single triangle here but once you make these curves as straight lines you will have the Dolnoy triangulation and the thing is that every Voronoi vertex actually corresponds to a cell or a face we can say in the graph this is another Voronoi vertex and we have a cell for it. For instance, we have another Voronoi vertex here. By the way, this is not Voronoi side. This is Voronoi vertex. And as you see, it has a cell for this vertex. And that is true for all the vertices of the Voronoi diagram. But if you make these lines uh, straight, it, it will be quite difficult to see. For instance, if you look at here, in this triangle, we don't have any vertices, right? Since we, we made it, made these lines uh, straight, we cannot easily see uh, whether a single Voronoi vertex is residing inside the cell or not. But if you look at the previous graph, it's highly clear. You can clearly see that in each portion, for instance, if you look at here, it's a complicated portion, but we only have a single Voronoi vertex, which is here. In Kaiser's guide uh, about the relation between the Voronoi diagrams and Dolnoi triangulation. A teacher, uh, the line connecting the sites can be anywhere in the edge, right? The, in the common edge. In the triangulation, do you say, or in the previous slide? In the previous slides. Yes, they can be anywhere, but at least they should be touching this common edge. This okay. may, for instance, pass through this point, but at least be touching the common edge between these two Voronoi uh, cells. That is the only requirement. So now we can say that this is actually Dolnoi graph, or we can say that this is Dolnoi triangulation of the given set, point set P. We call it also as dual graph. This is dual graph, or sometimes we call it as Dolnoi graph. Since they have the same abbreviation, sometimes uh, there are such misusage, but we can say that they are all the same. So now let's have a look at some other theorems. This is the fifth one. It says that the Dolnoi graph of a planar point set is a plan graph, right? This is uh, a very simple theorem. And the dual graph has phase for every vertex of Voronoi diagram of the point set P. We have already seen this. And we have another, uh, uh, let's say, observation. If the vertex of Voronoi diagram P, V is a vertex of the Voronoi cells for the size P1, P2, and P3, then we can say that that face in the dual graph has these Voronoi size as the vertices of the dual graph. Let me go back and show you that. Yes. So as you may assume that this is I, this is J, and K. So you have a Voronoi vertex, and if this Voronoi vertex uh, is actually at the intersection of the Voronoi size i, j, and k, and then the theorem states that we should have a kind of an cell in the triangulation of the graph in between these two uh, to three Voronoi sides. This is what is written here. So if a vertex V of Voronoi uh, diagram P is a vertex of the Voronoi cells for the size in our example IJK, then the corresponding face or tri is triangle in our example has these Voronoi size as its vertices or the corners of the triangle. 
Let's go into some other details. Uh, That's an important part, actually. We will be assuming that the distributed points are always in general position. Now, we will discuss what a general position is. So if you have some points at P, and if you distribute them randomly, then the chance of uh, four points actually being on the same curve is highly small, very small. As you see, this is the, the thing actually, this is the case we are now mentioning. You see, we have distributed the uh, Voronoi size, the points, and now you see that they're on the same circle. They're on the same uh, circle, and you see that as the Voronoi diagram, this is the vertex of the Voronoi diagram, and we have four edges connecting at this Voronoi vertex. But this is a very rare case, and we will be assuming that there is no four points on a circle in the general position. So in the general position, we can have at maximum three Voronoi size, and which means that actually we can only have three edges per Voronoi vertex. If that's the Voronoi vertex, and if you have a general position, then you can only have uh, three edges actually going out or going into the Voronoi vertex V. This is called as general position. And the degree of these Voronoi vertices are, as you see, three. So this is having three edges connecting at this vertex states that the degree of these vertices are three. And once you have it, if that's the case, actually, if you have uh, the dual uh, the graph, then all the portions, all the connected cells will be, or the faces will be triangles. But if they are not in the general position, like in this case, as you see, this is the dual graph. And we can see that this dual graph is not composed of triangles right now. Since it's not in general position, you see that we are in quadrilateral. But if, if all the points are in general position, then for sure we can say that the faces of the dual graph will be just composed of triangles. Any questions, guys? This is an important issue. And we will make use of this property in the other upcoming slides. Okay. So we can say that uh, the noise triangulation of our point set P is unique. If your dual graph, if your point sets are all in the general position, this is the only thing you can have a unique dual graph. If they are not in general position, then the obtained uh, triangulation will not be unique. And you need to do some legalization to obtain the Dillnoy triangulation, since the Dillnoy triangulation should be the unique one and the angle optimal one. Now we have other theorems related to this basic triangulation. Now again, we have the points at P, seeing that there are three points, and these are uh, the same points, the points actually on the same face. So you see that this is the kind of triangle. We have I, J, K. So if there are the uh, vertices of the same face of the linear graph of our points at P, if and only if the circle is passing through these points, let me try to make a circle. Assume that this is a circle. If that's the case, then we should, shouldn't have any actually size inside. So if any, if you, if you want to check uh, the triangles in your Dillner graph, and if you cannot locate a point inside these circles, then you can say that they are the triangles actually belonging to the Dillner graph. Then we have another thing related to the edges. 
if you have two points, I and J, let's draw it here, kind of an edge. And as we are assuming that this is the edge of the linear graph of P, and if and only if you haven't closed this, let's say C, uh, which is containing PI and PJ again on the boundary of that disk. Oops. If that is your disk, and if you have uh, PI and PJ on the boundary and they are forming an edge, and if you see that there is no other point inside, then we can say that, yes, this is a part of your Delaunay triangulation or Delaunay graph right now. But if you have another point inside, then we can say that this is not belonging to the edge of Delaunay graph. Another theorem we have, again, we have a set of points P, then we have a triangulation tau. Then we can say that the given triangulation is a Delnoy triangulation if and only if the circumcircle of any triangle does not contain any point inside. So if you can prove this one, then your triangulation is actually the Delnoy triangulation. We have another theorem related to that. Again, we have the same set of points. Then a, a triangulation tau of P is legal if and only if our triangulation is a Delnoy triangulation. So if you satisfy theorem seven, then we can say that your triangulation is a Delnoy triangulation. These are very similar theorems. Then actually we can summarize that if you find an angle optimal triangulation and if you have any, if you don't have any legal edges, then we can say that that is an Delnoy triangulation of the given point set P. And if you have all the points actually in the general positions, general position, if you are not uh, having any quadrilateral on your Delnoy graph, then we can, we can say that this is the, the you, only, you can only have a single triangulation, single legal triangulation, and that will be the dominant triangulation we are looking for. But if you are not, if the points are not in the general position, which means that you may have a uh, kind of a qualitarial, and if that's the case, then any triangulation will be the dominant graph of that, uh, of the dominant graph will be legal. So what happens, what you're going to do if you have quadrilateral? So assume that while converting your Voronoi diagram into dual graph or dual graph, you may come up with such a quadrilateral since the points are not in the general position. So what you need to do, you need to do an extra triangulation on this quadrilateral. So once you have it, then we can say that this graph is legal and we can have any legal triangulation since there is another possibility you can also have a triangulation in this direction so that you there might be many legal triangulations but if they're in the general position then we exactly have a single legal triangulation and that legal triangulation is the Dillner triangulation so I think this is the last theorem we have, uh, another similar one. So if you have uh, any angle optimal triangulation, then that is the Delnoy triangulation. And that Delnoy triangulation actually should be maximizing the minimum angle. If you remember, this was our main goal in, during the triangulation. We are trying to maximize the minimum angle of the given triangulation. In questions, guys, about the computation, about the theorems, about the basics of the Illinois triangulation. Okay, now let's discuss how we are going to do the computation of the Delnoy triangulation. So once you have the Voronoi diagram, then things are not complicated. 
you can simply connect the Voronoi size, uh, Voronoi size together and obtain the Delnoy triangulation or Delnoy graph, you can say. And if in that graph you have some quadrilaterals, then you need to do some extra triangulation as we have done in the previous slides. This is actually what we have done in the previous slide. But right now, instead of using the, uh, the Voronoi diagram, we will look for an, another algorithm, which is calculating, which is computing the Delnoy triangulation from scratch. So we will just start with Voronoi size, and simply size, not Voronoi size, but by using the points on the plane, we will obtain the Delnoy triangulation. But right now, we will not be using an sleep line algorithm. Instead, we will be using an, that's a different approach, randomized incremental approach. So initially, assume that these are kind of sides on our plane. So what we are going to do, we will start with a very large triangle. We will have some fixtures points. Assume that uh, we have another one here. And then we will try to draw a very large triangle. Forget about this side. What we are going to do is that we will start with a very large triangle. And initially, we will have extra points. These are fixtures points, which were not present actually in the given set. But we add these to make our things simpler. Another point we are using is this top point. So initially, we have three uh, sides and we have a single triangle. And then what we do? In this randomized incremental approach, we simply pick a site actually. Randomly, we pick a site. Assume that we pick this one. Once you pick it, then you are going to do triangulation. So, once you have it, how we can do triangulation? You need to connect this one to the other sides in the triangle. So, now how many triangles do we have? So let me make a better triangle here. So these, this is the initial triangle, the first triangle, the first largest triangle we have. And then once you have a random point here, then you do the triangulation like this. So initially we have a single triangle, but after the triangulation, we now have three triangles, right? And then if you continue incrementing this, uh, let's say the number of sides, assume that you have another side here, then you need to do further triangulations. Okay. Now we have how many? We had it two more, we have five triangles, right? Well, what about the angle optimal optimum criterion? Is it okay? Do we have an angle optimum uh, triangulation right now? Probably not. We have since smaller angles here. So what we need to do is to actually do legalization after each each side is added to your triangulation. So the algorithm is not complicated. You will be adding Voronoi, uh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm always using the term Voronoi, but we are not dealing with the Voronoi size. If you are adding a side into your triangulation, then you simply do first the triangulation and then check whether you have some illegal edges in the triangulation or not. So the main algorithm is simpler obtain a large triangle and then start adding these uh, sides one by one, do the triangulation. And if you come up with an illegal edge, simply legalize them and 
continue with the next size. Now you actually have a better illustration. Yes, these are the size. This is a given set actually, a given set P. But now in order to obtain a larger, a larger triangle around these size, we have extra size, P minus two and P minus one. As you see, once we add these, then all the size, all the points inside P will be inside the triangle. And the coordinates of these points are not important. They are fixtures, so uh, their X and Y values are not important right now. So we are going to determine actually the Dunlop triangulation of not just P, but P union with these extra points. And then later what we are going to do, we will simply remove any edge actually related with P minus two and P minus one at the end of this algorithm. That will be a very simple operation. Once you have the Dunlop triangulation of P union, these two extra points. Any questions, guys, about the fundamentals of this algorithm? No? Okay. So as we discussed, our algorithm is a randomized incremental one. So we'll be adding the size one by one in the random order and while adding we need to maintain, actually this is the important part of the incremental algorithms. You should always maintain the Dunlop triangulation of the given subset of the point set P. So you may have, let's say, uh, this order, P1, P2, P3, up to let's say Pn you have. And at any point of your algorithm, for instance, you have, let's say, P12 here. Once you stop here, then you should have a proper triangulation of, volumes of, of size up to this point. So you should always maintain the Dunlop triangulation. So why, how we are going to do the triangulation? So once you add a point at a random point PR, you need to first find the triangle which your actually PR is residing. Let me illustrate it here. Assume that this is our current triangulation. We have three triangles in the donor triangulation and now we are adding a new point, a new side, but we don't know where this PR is. So we need to find the location of the triangle which actually containing PR. So if you look at here, this is a triangle we are looking for. So once you find it, then you can do triangulation inside this triangle. And if the if your point is exactly on the edge, for instance, if the point is here on this edge, then it's much simpler by simply connecting this point to the opposite corner you can complete your triangulation. Here we can see the examples. Uh, if you have the left-hand side case, the case on the left-hand side, if your knee point is exactly inside a triangle, then by simply connecting three edges to the corners, you can complete the triangulation. But if you have this PR exactly on the edge of a triangle, then you need to write, draw actually edges to the opposite corners, to PL and to PK. If it's on the boundary, obviously, you'll only have a single edge uh, resulting from this triangulation. But the thing is that, as we discussed, once you add this PR, you may have an illegal edge. That might happen uh, sometimes, so once you come up with an illegal edge after the addition of PR, then you need to do some legalization or you need to call a procedure as legalized edge. 
So that is actually uh, the main algorithm of the Illinois triangulation. And right now we are not using the Volnoy diagram first and then converting it into a Delnoy triangulation. We are starting from scratch. We only have a set of points and the output will be the Delnoy triangulation. So what we do, we find the top, the, uh, top of the largest triangle, which, is P, which will be named as P0, and that will be the next to the highest point inside P, having the <clears throat> having sometimes largest Y coordinate. It depends on their orientation, but mostly it will be the point having largest Y coordinate. So then once you have it, you need to put two fixtures point, P minus one, P minus two, and form a large triangle between these three points, P0, minus one, and minus two, and then do a kind of a random permutation and start dealing, start adding these actually sides one by one. So as you see, we have a for loop here. We pick a side from our list and then insert into our triangulation. And what we need to do, we need to find the triangle, which is exactly containing our new point PR. So if, it, if PR is lying inside the triangle, PI, J, and K, and then we need to add three edges to each corner. But if it's not inside, it's relying on, on the edge of the triangle we found, then we need to do different operations. And as you see, this is important. Once you generate new edges inside your triangulations, you should always call this function, legalize edge. And you see the inputs are always modified, but uh, this function should check whether you have an illegal edge. If you have it, then it should legalize these edges so that your overall triangulation will always be a legal one. Then after you are done with all the size, all the points, you can simply disregard the edges actually connecting to P minus one and P minus two. And lastly, you can simply output the result. Any questions? So which edges actually will be illegal while we are adding PR or the new points? Actually, the already existing edges might be illegal sometime, depending on your uh, selected, let's say, size. Uh, not just the neighbors, but the whole world, the whole Illinois triangulation might be illegal. So you need to always start with checking the new triangles and then continue with checking the neighbors. And that will be done actually with the help of legalized edge function, and it will be flipping these illegal edges and make them legal. And the thing is that while doing uh, legalization, you may generate new illegal edges. So that's why this function should always call itself and try to solve all these illegal edge problems. This is actually a simple pseudocode of legalized edge function. And as you see, it's always calling itself. After doing flipping operation, it's calling itself to check whether the generated edges are okay or not. If you, generate, if you have generated illegal edges in this function, then they will also be legalized with the help of this recursive approach. Now we can see a, a nice example here. This is a triangulation up to now, a Dunlop triangulation. And right now, we are adding a new site, PR, exactly to this point. And after that, you are calling legalize edge function, and then you can see the result. And it is totally different with respect to the first one. Let's count the number of triangles. We have three, six, seven triangles. And right now we have, I think, nine triangles, right? 
five. Yes, nine triangles we have, and three, four, five, six, seven. We have added two more triangles. Another thing is that uh, they are completely different. The topology of the triangles are completely modified by just adding a new side PR. So let's focus on just this triangle, okay? Let me try to draw a bit larger one. So now we are adding this PR here. Once you add it, you need to do triangulation like this one. And let me draw other neighbors. This is the neighbors. Okay. Now we can clearly see that this edge is an illegal one, right? It has a very small angle here. We can simply erase this one and make it legal. So how we are going to do it, we can have, we can connect the other corners together. And I can do it simply by connecting this one to the other one. And actually that is the edge which is drawn here. So you see, we have, have, we have done some legalization and modified the structure of this part of this region. And furthermore, uh, if I let me switch to once again red color. Let me draw the other neighbor here, this neighbor. That will be this one. And you can clearly see that we have another illegal edge on the left hand side of this knee point PR. Now we need to do another legalization. And we will be connecting this side to here. So you see, this is actually let me. Yes, that one is the one actually we just worked on it. But if you continue further, since this legalized edge function should be a recursive function and should always check the check the new edges whether they have generated legal edges or not. And if you continue checking the neighbors, you will see that we have further legal edges. And once you done all the legalization, you will obtain, obtain a totally different triangulation. So in summary, your legalized edge function should call it itself in a recursive manner to obtain uh, the legal triangulation.